Well, okay, are you all mic'd, ready to go? Two of you, okay, well, come on up, Dr. Vanderland, and uh, uh, we can wait for, you mic'd as well? You're good, no, okay, that's okay, he'll, he'll find us. Can I just put it in? Perfect. There we go. Three for three. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us for our panel. And um, to my left, we have Dr. Bill Vanderland. He is the Director of Safe and Secure Operations Office at IARPA. That's the Intelligence Advanced Research Project Activity. And um, then we have Doug Mon. He's the Director of the Cybersecurity Division at the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. And we have Nate Lesser, who is Deputy Director of the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So those are very long titles, but all very great people to have on this panel. And um, the theme is how we get cutting edge research out of the lab and into the private sector. So um, I guess let's just to kick us off. What is one way each of you in all of your various capacities are, are working to do this? Bill, let's start with you. Okay, so uh, you should be. Um, yeah, I think you're. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, so as you said, IARPA is the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity. Mm -hmm. As you might guess from our name, we are similar to DARPA. We're uh, inspired by them. We use a similar method of having program managers who release a broad agency announcements to solicit proposals, and we evaluate them. So we definitely work closely with industry and academia in awarding contracts to them. So is there one strategy that you can point to, one program that um, shows how you're moving uh, cutting edge research into the private sector from, I mean, the intelligence agencies, that's a, you know, seems like some of those programs might be used for secret purposes, but the private sector, you know, could maybe take some lessons as well. Okay, well, let me describe one of our programs, which is managed by Conrad VC, who recently completed his term at IARPA. It's called Stone Soup, which stands for Securely Taking on New Executable Software of Unknown Provenance. It's a very, very long acronym there. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to be a program manager at IARPA, you need to be very good at coming up with these fancy, uh, clever acronyms. Okay, so Stone Soup. Mm -hmm. Stone Soup uh, was software that was developed to automatically look at uh, say off-the-shelf software packages mm -hmm. and evaluate them for security vulnerabilities and automatically fix them. And so we thought this would be useful to a lot of different people and so we decided to put that in the public domain. So you can now find that software on the Software Assurance Marketplace sponsored by DHS, what's known as the SWAP. SWAP and Stone mm -hmm. Soup, that's, well that's interesting because you know it is an intelligence research arm, intelligence agency, but it seems like a lot of the challenges will be, are faced as well by the private sector, and we will get to that topic as well. So, um, so Doug, what is one um, way that DHS moves some of its uh, technology that you're developing in your labs into the private sector? Uh, sure, we have a program called Transition to Practice. It was initiated in 2012 out of the uh, White House Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative. It's aimed at uh, finding government-funded research in the labs across uh, DOE, DOD, and FFRDCs. And so for the last three years, we've taken uh, about eight technologies per year out of the labs and worked through the process of um, testing and evaluating, red teaming, working with the labs and their tech transition offices to commercialize those technologies. We've commercialized five so far, and we have several others in the pipeline. Interesting. And Nate, how about you? So if you think about the spectrum of activities that the government can be involved in and our colleagues in the, in the ARPAs, um, we and, and DHS s and broadly, the uh, transition to practice program is a great example of seeing how early stage research, and uh, Dr. Prabhakar talked about this, how early stage research looks three, five, sometimes 10 years out. What's, what's the, the art of the possible? What's achievable? Uh, at the center, we're really focused on what can we do today? How can we solve today's problems with today's technology? So we fill that gap at the other end of the spectrum. 
Um, an example of, of something that we've done recently is looking at the use of mobile devices in patient environments and how you can better protect patient information in a healthcare environment when using mobile devices to collect, process, and transmit data. Um, and the interactions between mobile devices and infrastructure in a hospital environment. We've published that work. The example that we built at the center to address some of those challenges, again, based on those risk management principles, those, those fundamental standards and best practices, and then looking at how we can increase the rate of adoption for good security technologies that are out there today. Um, so that's one example of something that's out for public comment right now, and we're seeking feedback from implementers and organizations that have these challenges and are looking to address them uh, so that we can improve the work that we're doing at the center. It's interesting. And so uh, something that, we, that came up earlier in the conversation with uh, Dr. Prabhakar is this uh, asymmetric nature of uh, cyber conflict. And so it seems like attackers could also be collaborating with each other, but it seems like the patchwork of different agencies and different people on the side of defense and the government um, is pretty spread out and maybe more bureaucratic than some, a group of hackers. So I mean, what are some challenges that you see in um, coming together to come up with these cybersecurity solutions within the government? And maybe, uh, Doug, do you want to take a stab at that? I'm um, happy to. So uh, I co-chair what is called the Cybersecurity and Information Assurance Interagency Working Group. 16 government agencies, including DARPA, IARPA, NIST, NSA, and, uh, and the DOD and others. Um, and that's the, the body that coordinates R&D across the government. I've been involved with that group for 20 plus years. Um, and I would say now more than ever, our agencies are collaborating. Uh, we take technologies that come out of NSF, for example, where they fund basic research. Mm -hmm. We'll bring them in as projects in DHS because we do a, uh, applied research. So I think there's a lot of mechanisms today that uh, the public doesn't see, that in fact the government is doing a lot more coordination than you would imagine in uh, both the research piece but as well as the, the transition. So, Transition to practice, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is all about helping those who might not be that good at transition um, get the technology out and commercialized uh, in some fashion. Have you seen that pick up in recent years as uh, cyber becomes more of a priority within the government? Yeah, we're, and we are, um, like I said, we meet regularly, we uh, work together on joint projects, we jointly fund technologies. Uh, we developed together the federal R&D strategic plan that was published in 2011. We're working on the 2015 federal plan that was mandated by Congress, uh, and there's six or seven agencies all working together to make that happen. And so, Nate, what about collaboration uh, between the government and the private sector? Could you point to one challenge that you see in, um, in bridging this gap between, between those universes? Uh, well, so structural challenge as opposed to a technical challenge? Is that what you um, Sure, structural challenge would be, would be interesting, but also if there is a technical challenge and there, I know that we, information sharing might be top of mind for some of the Sure, some folks I, I mean, there, there are no shortage of, shortage of fun uh, technical challenges for us to work on. Um, I think structurally, uh, Doug makes a very good point. The government is collaborating and coordinating in a way that uh, I, in, in my sort of 10 years of doing this, haven't seen. Um, there's a, a, a pace of innovation, and I think one of the main drivers there is the recognition that while the U.S. federal government is still the largest single market for cybersecurity technologies in the world, we're no longer driving, from an economic perspective, the driver behind cybersecurity innovation. Uh, certainly there are lots of drivers out there and the government is one of them, but we, we aren't the big player the way we were five or ten years ago uh, in terms of procurement. A lot of times you hear about new startups and technology companies, even the large uh, and established technology companies, saying we are no longer focused solely on or focused first on the federal marketplace. We're looking to commercial adopters first and the, the federal government is secondary for us. Um, that's new, that's a, that's a change. And I think the, the recognition of how the economics play in the private sector are, is very significant for us to understand because fundamentally we have a mission to help increase uh, security that affects our national uh, security, affects our economic security across the country. And so we need to be aware of where critical infrastructure exists, 
uh, we need to understand that the vast majority of critical infrastructure is owned and operated by the private sector in the United States. And that means that we have to be out there talking with the people who run business, who understand the business challenges, who understand the mission for organizations that are not fundamentally cybersecurity organizations. And as technologists, we need to do a better job of understanding what will work in their environments. Interesting. And so, Bill, what is your take on this? I mean, do you at IARPA see the um, private sector and consumers as um, you know, almost equal or in some ways greater priorities than serving the intelligence community? And how, what's the interplay between, um, you know, how would you raise the bar for the, the regular folks who are not you know, with secret security clearances? Well, certainly privacy and security are important to everyone. Um, the government doesn't have the market power the way we used to. It's, uh, very broad market for security products. And so do you see um, some of the approaches starting to come to become more similar as uh, companies and are facing increasingly complicated advanced threats? I mean, you have in some cases like Sony, you have a nation state allegedly targeting a, uh, a private company, an entertainment company. So do you think that the private sector also has to start to um, innovate? And what, how do you see the collaboration between the government on some of these fronts? Well, I think absolutely the private sector needs to be very concerned about we see hacks reported in the newspaper almost every day. Okay. And so um, you mentioned privacy, and we talked a little bit about Stone Soup, um, your, your program as well. Um, and so, I mean, post Snowden, it's an interesting time for maybe an agency like IARPA to start thinking about uh, privacy. I mean, how did that serve as any type of um, catalyst or need to, for the intelligence you know, research arm to start thinking about new technologies for privacy? Well, actually, we started a program, kind of easy started a program five years ago on privacy. It's called Security and Privacy Assurance Research, or SPAR. And the SPAR technology is designed to allow someone to query a database without the intent of the query being known. So say the authorities want to investigate a suspect uh, by querying uh, public databases, but they don't want to uh, make it appear that they're under suspicion, since that would be a violation of the person's privacy. Uh, so the, there's a new technology called homomorphic encryption, which allows you to uh, manipulate and work with data while it's encrypted. Mm -hmm. So you can send an encrypted query into an encrypted database and get an encrypted result back without the owner of the database uh, knowing what was asked. Interesting. So what is one, um, you know, what is one hypothetical example of how the intelligence agencies might use something like this, but also how it might be useful in the private sector? Well, there's a large amount of data, as was described earlier, each time you go to the grocery store, uh, you're giving out information about yourself. Mm -hmm. And there's more and more data being compiled uh, through internet searches. Uh, we can conceive of cases where you would want to have the ability to access that database without uh, giving away too much information. Interesting. And so, Nate, you, earlier you mentioned critical infrastructure and how uh, the majority of it in this country is owned and operated by the private sector. And what are some of the um, ways to ensure that the patchwork of companies that are involved in this um, are all aware of and even held accountable for having best cybersecurity practices in place? Well, so we, we often refer to cybersecurity standards and best practices, and then we immediately backtrack and say, well, we, we don't want to imply that there is a best practice, right? There are best practices. There are things that we've kind of not yet codified as standards, but that are uh, in the space of, um, of principles, practices, procedures, we, we think of as, um, as strong, as good. Um, it ties very much into what organizations think about in terms of risk management programs. Mm -hmm. So we always tie the work that we do back to an initial risk assessment and, and the management of risk within our mock organization, whether that's a, um, a hypothetical uh, in, in health care organization or an electric power provider or a financial services company when we establish the infrastructure that's intended to mimic one of those organizations and then we uh, test various different security methodologies within those spaces, the way in which we can implement security controls, 
we tie everything back to that risk management, uh, that sort of fundamental trade-off between the cost of technology and how you can eliminate or alleviate certain security uh, vulnerabilities. I, I, just to pick up on something Bill was saying, though, also about homomorphic encryption, you can see in the healthcare environment how there could be some really interesting examples of the application of that technology when patients don't necessarily want to release information about themselves. You can imagine each individual is saying, well, I want my, my information not just encrypted as it resides at rest inside of a database, but I want any doctor in a hospital system who is supposed to interact with that information not to be able to decrypt it and get the record about me, but still be able to query it and find out for maybe how many patients in this hospital have lupus or some other type of disease without knowing specifically who. And that's, that's where things like homomorphic encryption can extend into uh, some interesting uh, privacy or uh, security examples within the private sector as well. That's interesting. So just to pick up on something you said earlier is, um, you know, you shy away from saying that there is one best practice. I mean, so what is the aversion to doing that, you know, within, within the government? And Doug will ask maybe you the same question too. I mean, why not just say this is, this is what we're doing, everybody get on board. I mean, <laughs> what's, the, what's the reason behind this? Well, well I'll, I'll, I'll let Doug answer too, but I, I, my, my sense is that there, there, there are two reasons. One is fundamentally, as security professionals, we know that there's nothing that's, there's no silver bullet, there's nothing that's unhackable. We, it, it's always about this question of how do I reduce risk? How do I shift risk? How do I manage the risk in my environment uh, so that I'm getting that right level of uh, security that, that I'm, I'm reducing those things that could have a real mission impact. Those, and I'm, I'm always making those trade-offs and, and those decisions. Um, but I would also say there are times when we say there's a minimum baseline. Um, and sometimes minimum baselines are really bad because it drives everybody to what we think of as a common floor rather than mm -hmm. trying to encourage people to exceed beyond those baselines. Interesting. Doug, what do you think about that? Well, pretty similar thoughts, uh, but I, I think there are places where the government has in the past established standards uh, that then people can build to interoperable standards so that you know, the, the market increases and you still uh, get increased security as opposed to um, Dictating. But I agree with Nate in a lot of cases. You know, there's no silver bullet. It's not cookie cutter. Everybody's not going to be the same. There is this question of, you know, how do you get above the common floor so, so that uh, you know people are more secure than than just the bare minimum. And so, um, what responsibility then do consumers have in this? And we talked a little bit about that with uh, Dr. Prabhakar, but um, you know, some people are saying that consumers should bear the responsibility for. Um, what some people in this room would probably consider bad behavior on the internet, you know, opening up shady attachments or failing to update security software. I mean, are there some tech solutions that could kind of eliminate this onus on consumers to take care of themselves, or do consumers just have to wake up and uh, start to, to pay a lot of attention? Um, Who are you asking that to? Yeah. Well, okay. Okay, I don't know. You look like you have some, some thoughts well, I, on this, I, Bill. I think we need to have commonly used applications which do things automatically. Right now it is possible to encrypt your email uh, to friends and family, but it's difficult. It's a, a little bit of a pain to do that, so people don't routinely do that. But if your email program is set up to do that very easily and so it's transparent to the user, then you will see people start to do that. Interesting. And Doug, what do you think? Well, I, I'm oftentimes a, a troublemaker. So um, I'm of the belief that we can't expect the users to be the cybersecurity geniuses. Some of us might be, you know, degreed in computer science, and so therefore we know a lot more, but, you know, grandma's not gonna know anything and know, know what to do with it. Uh, I think it's high time we start thinking about holding people accountable for producing products that might be insecure, um, but we're not doing anything about it. So whether that's some form of legislation, regulation, other kinds of things, at some point in time, we can't expect all the users to be cybersecurity experts. Uh, it's just like water and air. Cyber should be secure, and you shouldn't have to worry about whether it is or not. Interesting. Right? So you mentioned um, holding maybe companies accountable, but there's you know we just talked about how um, there's this hesitance about having standards and 
um, mandates from the government as well. So what's the way to toe that line and actually have you know things that people can do and reasonable expectations? And who who does who holds them accountable? Is it you? Yeah, yeah and I think that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think uh, in fact the question earlier that was asked about the software assurance stuff and Mudge and his stuff. There's already been a lot of people thinking about. Uh, software security and you know what does an underwriter's lab look like for software right mm -hmm. so there's an underwriter's lab it's been around for a really long time um, we don't buy devices uh, you know we don't even think about it we just go buy a toaster and we already know that it's you know assured to, to work right right how do how do we do that in software right so can I create a, a capability that allows me to test and evaluate software that say you know it does everything it's supposed to and it doesn't do things it's not supposed to I can probably never do that at 100%, but if I can give you a 99% guarantee, one, that gives you something, some confidence in buying, two, it holds the, the developer and the company responsible and liable to some degree mm -hmm. to make sure that they're not even being able to put it on the market until it's good enough to get a stamp of approval. And the question is, who should be that stamp of approval? Is it the government? Is it a nonprofit company or, or something like that? I think you know, that's a good public debate to have, but we have to, we have to move off from uh, just wringing our hands and saying, oh, I don't know what to do about it. Hmm. Yeah, so the program that you're mentioning too, um, uh, Chris Castelli, who I don't know if he's still here, but he reported on it for Inside Cybersecurity and that um, Mudge, the security researcher, is developing this publicly available tool to allow consumers to be able to tell what products have um, good cybersecurity, poor cybersecurity, finding a way to independently rate that so people can actually you know, hmm. pierce through this and understand what um, the specs are, but what are some other ways that could be innovative to um, bring in the private sector and get them involved and bring in consumers? Um, I mean, a lot of companies now are using bug bounties to um, have hackers, encourage hackers to come forward and tell companies about security weaknesses they find. But I mean, it, it kind of raises this question, if the US government just offered to pay the most money for vulnerabilities, I mean, could it improve cybersecurity for everyone? And should, what, what, are you thinking about that at all? And are there other ways, um, innovative ways that you could bring in the hacker community in this? Bill, you're kind of smiling. I well, I, I like the you. idea. I like what uh, <laughs> DARPA is doing with the, the prize uh, challenge that mm -hmm. will be implemented at the Black Hat Conference. Yeah, millions and of we, dollars we, is a pretty good incentive. It is, and you're bringing in people who you wouldn't normally work with as a government agency. Mm -hmm. Nate, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I, I do. I mean, I, fundamentally, I think we're talking about economics, right? So there's an insatiable appetite for uh, more features, for more mobile features, for uh, new Internet of Things devices. I rode in on an Uber this morning, which means I gave somebody I've never met before my home address and uh, some access to information about uh, my name and probably my phone number, maybe leaked some part of my credit card information as well. Um, and yet, I, I, you know, until somebody comes and breaks into my house, or even if my credit card is stolen, I probably don't care that much because I don't have any liability, right? So if that person managed to figure out how to charge a whole bunch of things to my credit card, I, yeah, okay, so the credit card company covers it. Um, I just learned about a, an app that I could have used to drive in myself and have somebody take my car. I could, could have you know, got an automatic valet parker. Um, I am not yet comfortable with the idea of handing my keys over to a complete stranger, but I, you know, two years from now, after I don't hear about anybody stealing cars that way, I, I, I might be willing to do that. We have, uh, it's so pervasive, uh, and, and in some ways it's really sort of like a, supply and demand in the, in the war on drugs. We're just absolutely willing to accept higher and higher levels of um, privacy, uh, of threats to our privacy, of, of threats to our own personal information, as long as the economics don't support me as an individual needing to in increase security or the security tools and products aren't just simply easy to implement. So as we see things like mobile pay, mm -hmm. where I, you know, generally just hand my credit card over to somebody who swipes it and it's unencrypted and, you know, maybe in the best case scenario there's point-to-point -point encryption between the point-of-sale system and the back-end processor. Um, mobile pay is really easy for me to use, whether it's Apple Pay or Samsung or Google. I can just hold my, my phone up to the thing. Well, if that's providing a tokenized version of my credit card, there's greater security in there, but I use it because it's easy, not because it's more secure. Hmm. And so I 
do want to pick up on the thread of encryption. Um, we had a few weeks ago a, an encryption debate with um, officials from the FBI and DOJ, and then we had an encrypted communications company and a uh, famous cryptographer come talk about this. And um, as m many of you in the room probably already know, um, companies are starting to ramp up encryption by default in part to protect against um, hackers, but law enforcement is pushing back and saying this um, you know, presents issues for their investigations and if the encryption is so strong that it's warrant proof. But if we do have a future, like you're mentioning, Nate, where encryption is much easier and um, that is considered a best practice in some ways for cybersecurity, I mean, what does that mean for the future of, of cybersecurity? I mean, is that a game changer? And what does that also do you consider what that might mean for law enforcement and people trying to figure out um, you know, who are the bad actors in the country? Well, I think, I don't know, I heard Doug give an answer to this question of encryption and law enforcement at a talk recently, and he has probably a more articulate answer than I do for this. Uh, you know, we, we often don't weigh in on, on policy. Um, this is, we're, we're as technologists, that's, that's our focus. Um, but I do think that uh, as we look at questions around adoption of technologies, whether they're across the government or in the private sector, Really, at the end of the day, we're talking about, just like my example of simplicity, how do I ensure that whatever I'm implementing from a security perspective, whether it's something on my phone that I use because it's convenient to me as an individual or something that affects an entire enterprise in telecommunications or electric power, it's something that really doesn't break the business process. Mm -hmm. And that's, from our perspective, that's what we really need to focus on. How do we better understand the business drivers here? Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to affect adoption. Interesting. And so actually both Doug and Bill, you're technologists in, a, in larger organizations that are um, you know, concerned with either law enforcement or intelligence gathering too. And so how do you see this issue playing out in your, your respective divisions and what are some of the um, potential futures with this issue? Bill, we'll, we'll, save, we'll save you Doug for oh, another good. few minutes. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Well, we fund high-risk, high-payoff research, so I prefer to leave encryption policy to our transition partner. Oh, okay. All right. Well, Doug, got it. I just need to find out from uh, Nate here exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it, it, there's a couple of angles, right? There, there is an economics angle to, to the going dark, uh, going bright discussion, right? Which, you know, how much do we want to um, handcuff our own companies? Right? We want them to be successful in the market, so how much of that should we actually do? I, I'm a believer that we probably haven't explored all the technical so solutions either. So maybe it's the case that you know, um, the technical folks need to be, work a little bit harder to try to come up with some solutions that actually help our law enforcement folks and let's not um, handcuff the companies in not only their business here but in, you know, in, in the full economic global market of cyberspace. Interesting. So you do want technologists to find a way to give law enforcement I, access? In, in under legal purposes, right? I mean, not just for in general, but when needed, do it through a technical means as opposed to through um, some, some uh, other back channel, if you will, kind of process. And so this is one of the issues that has um, been a hot topic on both the East and West Coast. And if you go to any of these conferences in you know, Black Hat and DEF CON and RSA, it's something that just you know, always bubbles up to the surface. Um, so we're talking about collaboration, but do you think that issues like encryption or even you know, going back you know, to Snowden and some of these other um, things contribute to a trust deficit? And if so, I mean, how do you think that relationships could be improved between the private sector and the government? Um, and you're all, again, in this sort of bridging capacity. So um, what, do you, what do you make of that? Nate, do you want to take a stab? Well, what we find is that uh, you know, there's a, there's, we have a little bit of an advantage in that NIST, by definition, our, our, our former director used to refer to us as an aggressively non-regulatory agency. Um, we do everything in a very open and transparent way. So the work that we do is uh, collaborative. It's published for public comment, both the challenges that we're going to work on and the research that we're doing in order to address those challenges. Um, we go through a significant amount of vetting um, in collaboration with our partners throughout the government and, and, and the private sector. So we, we, we are generally very protective, I mean, I would say extremely protective of what we think of as the level playing field that we can provide to industry and academia in order to come together and collaborate at, at NIST. Um, there's no question that 
those collaborative projects, whether they're ours or others, um, have come under fire in the last couple of years. Uh, I think fundamentally, we have to collaborate really well because the adversaries do. I mean, even in, a, in the absence of formal structures, uh, our adversaries have come up with fantastic creative ways to use marketplaces in order to drive uh, collaboration that in a lot of cases beats us out. And, uh, and so we need not just information sharing, but actual technical, um, you know, boots on the ground, working side by side collaboration. And so we have a big international audience uh, here today, uh, especially, and these are not just U.S. issues. And so how does the U.S. government, Doug, this one's to you, cooperate with other countries to, um, on projects and in this space? And how does the U.S. weigh its need to have a strategic advantage in this space with um, a desire to collaborate? So uh, I, I can speak you know, for DHS. Some of the other agencies may not be as collaborative or as as uh, globally focused as we are. And my, my job at DHS is to find the best technology and I really don't care where it comes from, right? So uh, DHS actually has 13 international agreements, uh, signed agreements country to country. We're doing joint projects with 10 of those 13. Uh, I know several of the people here that are from the Netherlands that uh, we, we actually have uh, four joint projects going on right now with the Netherlands, but we're, we're partnering with uh, uh, like I said, uh, 10 countries, uh, you know, some you might not think of. We're doing things with Singapore, we're doing things with Israel. Um, but um, my view is, you know, we don't have all the ideas, we don't have all the answers in the U.S. Uh, cybersecurity is a global sport by partnering together with our international partners. Um, you know, uh, we share intellectual property, we share technologies, and in the end, uh, those developing the technologies, that also helps open up markets for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a conference every year in London with our UK partners and uh, half of the speakers are US companies, uh, opening up the UK market to the US companies uh, as well. So I think there are ways to do collaboration on the, on the international scale um, that uh, you know, bring the best ideas together. Uh, I don't care where they come from. Great. Um, so we have time for some audience questions. Again, if you could say uh, who you are, where you're from, we're gonna start with Patrick Tucker. Over in the corner. Uh, yeah, thanks. Still, Patrick Tucker, still with Defense One. So this is a question primarily for Doug. Uh, the uh, Senate, uh, excuse me, Cyber Information Sharing Act, which uh, had been stalled for a little bit, is expected to go uh, to the Senate floor week after next. Uh, DHS. Uh, in July, publish a seven-page memorandum expressing some of their concerns about it and DHS's role in uh, that agreement, which is basically to serve as the point of contact and emergency for any national cyber threat. Uh, the information goes through DHS and then from there to NSA, DOD, FBI, whatever else. Um, so you guys have a seven-page memorandum expressing concerns about CISA. Some people have concerns about the role that DHS would play under CISA. Uh, do you think that some of those concerns have been addressed? Because uh, a lot of people are saying that it has a very good chance of passing week after next. Uh, I haven't seen an updated version on the bill, but I, I think we, I mean, I, I certainly share those concerns. I think there is this question of, uh, in the event of a cyber incident of some kind, do you really want some centralized uh, entity being the router for everybody and isn't there a better way for us to share information uh, in, a, in a different fashion and instead of a kind of a one organization receive it all and then try to farm it out to everybody else it would seem to me in a in a global community we ought to come up with some a little bit more technically smart mechanisms for information sharing than than a, than a centralized hub interesting do you see any cybersecurity issues within that just to follow up on that Look, it's a, it comes back to some trust questions, right? But if, if we're all in a community of sharing information, I can't guarantee everybody I'm going to share with, but uh, I think it's a better model to look at uh, the more broadly you share through a, through a distributed mechanism than trying to centralize hub. I think you're going to be a lot, you're going to respond faster um, as opposed to trying to go through one entity. Okay, okay. Uh, and yes, over um, on the far side here. Here, we have a mic uh, coming your way. Just want to make sure everybody can hear your question. My name is Elizabeth Kleinfeld from Holland FinTech from the Netherlands. 
Um, what are the specific areas that the eight technology companies that you're commercializing, what are they working on? Can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, who's the question to? From TTP. Oh, from TTP? Uh, oh, boy. Um, everything from hardware technologies, network management, uh, network security. Um, oh, boy. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't have them all memorized. I can just tell you uh, they're across the board, across all uh, capabilities. Uh, it, here's an easier way for you to think about it. Um, especially you'll get this if you're in the fintech world, right? So uh, we're working with the finance sector here in the US using the NIST framework, which talks about identifying, identifying detect, protect. protect, respond, recover. The finance sector has applied that to five classes of, of entities, devices, applications, networks, data, and people. So think of a five by five matrix. So we're actually working in about 15 or 16 of those 25 boxes with technologies that we're funding. And so we're trying to bring some of those technologies into our finance sector through uh, one of the uh, program that we've initiated this year with, the, with our US financial sector. Do you know how international that is at the moment? It's not. Um, We'd like was, to talk to you. I, I was in Canada yesterday and had communications with the folks in the Canadian government. And, and we're happy to have the conversation to see how we bring uh, not only the, the European but your own specifically finance sector in. Great. Um, and uh, yes, right. Uh, actually, let's go to you in the middle here, and um, we'll move our way over the room. Hello. Th thanks for doing this, guys. Um, so since the topic of the forum here is um, cybersecurity research and adoption, and it's possible that worldwide there's more research being funded in the private sector than actually in the government, um, how does the government capitalize on that investment? So, I mean, I'll take a first shot at it, Gary, is that, you know, in, in the end, you're exactly right. I mean, if you look at the numbers, uh, I think it's between 70 and 80% of the research is being funded in the private sector and 20 to 30% in the government globally. That's not just a U.S. statistic, right? Um, but I think how the government capitalizes on it, right? So I think there's, you know, there's a couple of questions here. One is, um, are we actually reaching into, from a government perspective, and finding those new innovative technologies um, uh, as a way to bring new innovation into our operational environments. And it, this, so that's one question more for the operators and the acquisition processes to ask, uh, to answer. I, I think we're doing better at that. I think there's a lot of improvements and some of that is um, the difficulties that the government has in um, doing acquisition with small co companies that have never done business with the government ever before. Very difficult task, but you know we're trying to make some headway there. I think the second part of that question is, what are we doing from the government funded side of research to ensure that those technologies are also making it out into the marketplace in some fashion? I gave you one example with TTP, but we have several other activities that we're trying to do. I think those are the two sides that, that we have to think about. Uh, in the end, it's all about getting, helping to get the innovator into customer one, right? If I can get them into customer one, and if that customer is government or private sector, because we have the critical infrastructure responsibility, or even state and locals, we have that responsibility too. I don't really care who, I need to help you, the innovator, get your technology into customer one. And if you're, succe you're successful, we can help you, they can help you, and you start to, to branch into the market. Nate, do you want to take a... Well, yeah, I would just that? add to that in that I, I see one other, which is uh, from the government perspective, we have a mission that, that concerns ourselves with things like our economic security nationally, right? So that means that if uh, our financial service system is weakened, then that's an impact that, that we are concerned about. We sort of government entities, big G government entities are concerned about. Um, and therefore, there's, a, there's another component, which is, is uh, how, how does the government benefit from these, these innovative technologies? One way is to help make the marketplace more efficient for getting those technologies into the hands of the people they, who need them. And like Doug said, maybe that's us on the operational side across government. But in a lot of cases, that might be the operational side across the private sector as well. Bill, do you have anything you want to add on this topic? No. No? OK. Any other? Uh, yes, right over here. Hi, Sharon Bovat, Voice of a Moderate. I've got a question about cyber espionage. When it's a private company um, attacking another private company, basically to make their product 
to hurt their product's reputation. So when this happens, you've got victims, and I'm not talking about financial data because they must report the breach if it's financial data. I'm talking about if it's photos shared on some private company and it's attacked because they want them to leave that company so then they'll go use their service and the people who were hacked don't want to report it because they're embarrassed that they were hacked and they think it could hurt their brand image. So I know when it's financial information, they must report mm -hmm. it, but is there any protection for the consumer when it's the actual product that's hacked? Okay, interesting question. Well, I think probably the answer is it's different depending on which sector you're, you're talking about. Um, I would say, uh, just a uh, sort of side note, the Ponemon, the annual Ponemon cost of cyber breach study just came out and there was I think we're down to $34 an hour for uh, in botnets, which you can buy, uh, commodity botnets you can buy and launch a DDoS attack. Mm -hmm. So it's certainly something to be concerned about if I'm, uh, I'm concerned about my competitors being able to do something in a timely fashion and I want to take them down. I, it's not very expensive for me to do that, at least for a short window of time. Um, from the consumer perspective, I think uh, it's, it's very sector by sector in terms of what regulatory bodies have decided uh, today at least when it comes to uh, breach notification. Though there's, there's quite a bit that is happening on the Hill to uh, change that. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes, over, over here behind you, Matt. Hi, uh, Michael Chern here from the Wilson Center. Thanks for this today. Um, so we've talked a lot about the economics of uh, cybersecurity and you know, market incentives to invest um, for firms. And some of this seems like it's a, a legal issue to me, and one of the things I was thinking about is um, tort law, so like a product's liability problem with these firms that, um, you know, civil lawsuits aren't often brought against companies because um, the damages, if let's say someone's data is released, doesn't necessarily meet a threshold for like physical damage or something like that. So I know this isn't, uh, you know, a conference on law, but it seems like it's relevant, and I'd be curious to get your take um, on some legal changes that you might want to see from uh, your unique perspectives in each of your departments um, with regard to cybersecurity and uh, investment in security. Uh, just, I'll bring one up that I think is actually a really interesting conversation with respect to legal. Um, we have a data sharing program with the research community. Um, it's been out there for nine or ten years now. And as part of that data sharing, um, I think it was really interesting, uh, Dr. Prabhakar's comments about the automotive piece. So one would ask uh, themselves the question about the ethical uh, behavior done in that research. Because it's human subject research, um, was that a wise idea? Who approved, what university approved that project to allow them to do that? I think we have not had the legal discussion tied in with the ethics discussion in some of our research communities. So our universities are responsible to do institutional review boards on any human subject research. Explain to me what you as a company have to do from an IRB perspective if you're doing human subject research in cyberspace. Nothing, right? So you can do that kind of research. I think that's a really interesting legal discussion because in the end, um, harm can be done uh, to uh, lots of people. There are plenty of experiments going on by researchers around the world where you know, the research is on you online, you may or may not know you're part of a research study. Um, I, th I think it's a really interesting legal discussion that we haven't actually had uh, as it applies to cyberspace. Interesting. Um, and yes, we have, did you have a question there? Or no, ghost question. Anybody else have a question from the audience? You have another question? Okay, uh, yes, we'll go to you. I hardly want to ask a question because I forgot to introduce myself last time. <laughs> Gary Gagnon from MITRE. Um, earlier we heard from DARPA about their um, research that they were doing to address the human problem, right? So given that a lot of defenders, one of the biggest challenges we have is getting qualified folks in the workforce to be able to defend these networks. So I was interested from IOPERA or from uh, Doug from your program, are you doing any work to try to assist on that human dimension? Um, Bill, do you want to take a step at that? Workforce challenges, how to bring in some of the... Uh, we're not addressing workforce challenges. Okay. So, um, some tools, but here's the, uh, here's the angle we take at it, Gary, which is, uh, you know, I, I believe we're uh, woefully underfunding the education piece in this country. Um, you know, 
Can, can I ask a question? So at what age do you think we ought to start teaching cybersecurity to kids? Two, three, five, right? Uh, and we're not really starting to teach this until they're 15 uh, or older, right? So, so I think from an education perspective, we're, we're, we're way behind the curve, right? And it, it's gonna have to change from a national perspective because it has to be taught in the schools. It's taught at home. It can be taught by home, at home by mom and dad, maybe. But in the end, you really have to figure out how to do that. So, so what are we trying to do? So we actually fund uh, the national collegiate competition every year. This last year, we had over 200 schools. Um, I don't remember the total number of students, but it's nationwide. Um, the winning school, University of Central Florida. You might not think that's a cybersecurity school, but that's the second year in a row they've won it. But I mean, it's, it, it's all about the next generation, right? We have to teach them and train them. The interesting piece for us is what we do in those competitions is we bring our technologies out of our program into the competition. So they're, having to, they're being exposed to three to five new technologies every year as part of this competition. So they're starting to learn about new technology. So as they leave college and go into the job market, they've already seen new technologies coming out of the research piece. But I really think you know, that's, that's how we get new things into their hands. Uh, you gotta put it in an environment where they can use it. So um, I'll ask one last question to follow up on, on that one. Innovation is not just a workforce issue, but it's also a communications issue in a sense as well. And you're all security pros, technology, uh, technical people within um, the government, but there's also this gap sometimes between policymakers. Sometimes you talk about how they're part of the flip phone caucus on, on the Hill and technologists who say, how are you making policy that you know, governs our technology? Um, when you are using a flip phone. Uh, so, I mean, what are some um, ways or tips or tricks even that you guys use to uh, translate what you do and the importance of these issues um, and to both policymakers but also to normal people who are not at all, all technical? And, and how do you see this, um, this communications gap sometimes playing a role in um, innovation? Um, Bill, or, or, or Nate, sorry, do you want to start with that? Well, I, I, for us, it's all about analogies, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. Prabhakar talked a lot about the kinetic effects of a cyber attack, but also how you can um, analogize certain things in the cyber world to biology. It's, it, it's fundamentally, it's always talking about the things that we care about in the language of the people that we're trying to influence. And I think I can't give you, uh, you know, here's the playbook because well, we're working on writing it, but we haven't written mm -hmm. it yet. Uh, for the time being, it's uh, the, the, the best that we've found that we can do is really listen and understand whether it's business processes or user experience or you know, the fundamental underpinnings of what someone cares about and then analogize what we do in cyberspace to what they do in their other uh, kinetic world. Interesting. So I think it's all about marketing, right? So that's the okay. marketing, marketing, marketing piece. Um, and I think, you know, not only the government, but I think in general, we don't do a, a good enough job of marketing. I think, you know, you talk about innovation, it's how do, I, how do I help the small business understand where the government is and how to get into the government? How do I help the students understand, you know, where there are opportunities for them, for jobs, for, and all of those kinds of things, we're not doing a very good job of helping people understand what the, uh, opportunities are, and uh, you know, I think it's you know, shame on us. We need to do a better job. Well, on that note, uh, we are out of time, but thank you all for joining us on this panel and for coming today. We're really glad to have you here, and hope to see you again at our next events. We have a few more coming up: security of the Internet of Things, and workforce challenges, and all sorts of other fun stuff. So please sign up for Passcode and be in touch. <laughs>